We're going to talk today about covenant. Uh, this class is entitled Essential Doctrines, and it's not simply here's the few, here's the things you must believe in order to go to heaven. It's, uh, I mean, actually, we do cover those things. Um, but the point is, here are the essential things that you and I must understand if we're going to teach the Bible. If we're going to understand it and teach it so that it can speak again. I think our assignment is to let the word of God speak again to our generation. And there's various truths and things that once we have them clear in our head, the, the Bible sort of makes sense. We can open it up and let it, let it talk. Let it prophesy. Let it challenge us and cut us and, and, and bless us. So you as, I'm, I view you as Bible teachers, I, I, whether you're teaching Sunday school or or a house church, or a, a congregation, or a, whatever you're doing, it will be built around the, the Word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. And so we're looking today at, at, a, at a concept that goes back 4,000 years, uh, at least. And it's um, not entirely easy to understand, but once you understand it, it begins to, you, you'll understand a great deal about the Old Testament and some of the most important <laughs> truths in the New Testament. So we need to understand covenant. So let's ask the Lord to bless us and be with us. Holy Spirit, uh, these things are spiritual truths. Um, they're, they're from you. And without you, we can't understand them. I pray, Lord, for the grace that you would allow me to explain as, as well as I know. And that you would open our ears and our hearts that that which is true would come through loud and clear. Lord, we love your word. And we love the truth that it teaches us. And so, Lord, may this come alive to us. Because we live in the new covenant. And we ask you to help us understand how profound and beautiful that is. We pray it in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. All right. If you, if you have your notes... Um, I'm going to read a bit, and then we're going to we're going to wade into a number of passages in Scripture and, and and have a look at those. So I'm going to just start by by reading the introduction. There are certain concepts that are absolutely foundational to the Bible. Unless we understand them, much of what we read will not make sense. We have no idea why certain things are being said or done, and the topic we're going to look at in this lesson is one of those concepts. It's not easy to explain because it takes us back to a very different time and culture. It takes us back 4,000 years to the ancient Near East. I, I say Near East because what we're going to look at isn't just biblical. This isn't just something people in the Bible did. This is something that just Hebrew people did. This is something that they did. This was a practice. Uh, it was a, a, a language, a way of saying something uh, that was done all over the Middle East. The Hittites did this, the, you know, the Amorites did this, the, the Babylonians did. So this was not exclusive to the Bible. It is a format, a, a way of, of saying something that was part of the culture of the day. And God uses it to say something to his people. That's, that's, that's a, something we need to see. We're going to study an ancient Near Eastern covenant ceremony. But we won't go into a lot of interesting but non-essential details. I'll try not to. We will look only at its most basic elements. Then once we have that knowledge, we'll watch as God conducts a set covenant ceremony with Abraham. That particular event had a lasting effect on the spiritual life of Israel and ultimately governed what was done to Jesus Christ on the cross. We will also look at the covenant God made with the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai and recognize the relationship between the blessings and the curses that were announced there and the message of the Old Testament prophets over the centuries that followed. Let's begin by examining some facts about covenants and then watch an ancient Near Eastern covenant ceremony in action. All right, here's, here's my definition. What is a covenant? <clears throat> the covenant is a promise reinforced by the threat of a curse if the promise is broken. And some covenants also are reinforced by the assurance of blessings if the promise is kept. There are promises, and then there are covenants. They aren't the same thing. 
a, co a, 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 a covenant is a solemn thing. Actually, in, in the ancient Near East, a fairly ugly thing uh, in the way it was done, where you'll see, as you'll soon see, it was it 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 it, it invokes a curse. The person who's promising is basically saying, may I be cursed if I break this promise? So, so you can see the seriousness of it. It, it puts a solemnity to it. It puts the, the, the fear in the process. Uh, it, was the, it was the highest form of promise, the most intense form of promise. In the ancient Near East, number one, the curse was solemnly acted out in a very gory, and vivid way. An animal or multiple animals were slaughtered and cut in half. The halves were laid on two sides of a trench and the blood from the animals was allowed to run down into the trench. So picture sort, sort of a small valley-like trench area and you cut these animals in half and all of that blood pours down into this trench. I told you it was ugly. The participants then walked side by side down that blood-filled trench in their bare feet. And as they did, they called upon their god or gods to curse them if they broke the promise they were making. So you can have, you can have different levels of covenant. You can have two people who are equal parties walking together, making a promise to one another, making this covenant with each other. You can have one who is, uh, and I use the term in here a bit, a, 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 a suzerain or a king, an emperor, a powerful one, as it were, a big guy and a little guy. You can have the, the vassal and, and the suzerain, the king and then and their subject here. Um, you can have, in, as we'll see, we'll have one situation where one person passes down there. As they walked, here's the deal, between the parts of the slaughtered animals, they said to God or their gods, they, in other words, they vowed, they swore. If I break this covenant, may this happen to me. So this gore on either side has a purpose. They're saying, if I break my word to you, may this happen to me. They're and, and, and understand, this is, they believed it would. <laughs> this, this isn't just a, 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 a shallow sort of thing. They, if, if, that, if I break my covenant, the gods, if, I, if, I'm, not a, if I'm not one of uh, Israel or, the, or, or God will bring this upon me. Um, you see it in, in Genesis 21, uh, just briefly. Listen to this, uh, 21 verse 27, you have Abraham and Abimelech. And it says, Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech. And the two of them, mine says, made a covenant. You know what the Hebrew says? Cut a covenant. Wherever your Bible says made a covenant, the, the actual Hebrew word is cut a covenant. Well, and for obvious reasons. So the two of them took the the Two, took the sheep and oxen and cut a covenant. They cut these things apart, laid them on two sides of this trench, and they walked between it, invoking a curse on themselves if they broke their covenant. Hey, this happened to me. By the way, I, I give you a reference there. Uh, where, where did I learn this? I, 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 I many, many, oh, so long ago now, I, I went to Fuller Seminary and I did a Master of Divinity degree. And I came out of that and I knew I didn't know anything about the Old Testament, nothing worth knowing. They taught me a lot of baloney uh, about you know, things that were documentary hypotheses. And I, I knew it, anyway, I didn't know what organized it. I didn't know, how, does, how do you preach the Old Testament? What holds it together? What's the message that I'm supposed to get out of the Old Testament? I didn't know. So I went on and I did a THM in Old Testament. I, I didn't finish it. I went to a church, but I, I did a bunch of it. And this is what I learned. And, and I, one of the things that I was given to read was this article that I, I list for you. And it's, it's available online. It's by J.A. Thompson. You see it, Ancient Near Eastern Treaties in the Old Testament. It was done in 1964. And there is the reference to it 
uh, you can read in detail what I'm going to talk to you about. He'll use Hittite treaties and things like that, but he'll take it to where we're going to go. He'll take it to the book of Deuteronomy. He'll show you Joshua, the whole thing. So I want you to know that what I'm talking about is scholarly and it is, it's sound. I, this isn't me coming up with an idea. Uh, this basically is accepted theology now. Jeremiah refers to this same practice 1,400 years later. Uh, listen to this, Jeremiah 34, 18 through 20. God says, I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not fulfilled the words of the covenant which they made before me, listen, when they pass, when they cut the calf in two and passed between its parts. The officials of Judah, the officials of Jerusalem, the court officers and priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the animal. So apparently all these leading officials all walked that trench filled with blood and called upon themselves a curse should they break their covenant with God, and then they did. Um, but that's another story. All right, now, now I want to look at the most foundational and important covenant, Genesis 15. So go with me to Genesis chapter 15. You know this story. Uh, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. Abraham is, um, has been promised by the Lord that he will have um, children and that they will inherit the land of, 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 of what is now Israel. Only he doesn't have any children. Um, and so he goes out apparently under the, in the night sky, you know, and it is an evening conversation. And he says to him, Lord, how can you, how can you fulfill your promise to me when I don't have children? Uh, Eliezer of Damascus, my servant, is going to inherit my estate. I, I don't have anyone to give it to. And then the, Lord, then the Lord says, this man won't be your heir. And verse four is where I am. But the one, one who come, shall come forth from your body, he shall be your heir. I'm going to give you a child. And he takes him outside. And he has him look at the starry sky. And he says, if you could count those stars, you could count how many children and descendants you're going to have, and spiritual descendants. Um, do you believe that? And then this is, this, is, this is what Paul picks up. Abraham, it says, Abraham believed God, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is the moment Abraham saved. Abraham's been a follower. He's been listening. But at this point, he lays hold of it, and he believes the impossible, as it were. He just says, God, I believe you. You will do what you've spoken. And then, now, now listen, verse 7, and he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees. So remember, he, he was from over there with the, in, in Babylon, basically. And his family were not, again, I, I was just reading another passage. He, his family were not uh, God-fearers. They, they served false gods, Terah, the moon god. To give you, uh, I, I took you out of the, of Ur the Chaldees to give you this land to possess it. And he said, Lord, how may I know that I shall possess it? What, what sign will you give me? Now, you could say he's testing God. Um, this got Zacharias in trouble uh, with uh, in the New Testament, but God does not respond that way. He, so he says, I, I haven't, how will you, how, will, how do I know this? How will you show me? And so the Lord says to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, that's a three-year-old cow that has not had a calf, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old male goat, a dove, and, and it basically says a nestling. Um, I, I take that to be the same thing probably. So we probably have a young dove, but others will say, no, the nestling's a pigeon. So whether or not it's a dove and a pigeon or just a young dove, I don't know. I don't think it matters a great deal. So anyway, he brings out these particular animals, and you know what he does. It says he brought them out and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds, so he must have cut its, its head. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abraham drove them away. So Abraham cuts them down the middle, laid each, each piece opposite its other half, but he did not divide the dove. He waited for God's next instruction. 
And as he waited, he had to drive off the vultures, the hawks, the eagles, the crows. They're all coming down on this raw meat, if you can imagine. When the sun was going down, the power of the Holy Spirit came over that place. And Abraham was basically slain in the spirit. When he came to, he became terrified, aware that God himself was present. You see, the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abraham, know for certain your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. He's prophesying. He's giving him the future. Where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. He's telling about Egypt. But I will also judge the nation which they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. I'm going to bring them out and bring them into the land. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in good old age. And then in the fourth generation, uh, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. I'm not going to give them the land yet until the people have become completely wicked. And so that they're become a in a sense, a spiritual vortex so that every child born into that culture is going to perish. When that happens, I'm throwing them out and I'm giving you the land. And it came about as the sun had set, it was very dark and behold, there appeared, and here's the, a smoking oven and a flaming torch. Basically as night arrived, it was fully dark and a brilliant fiery light passed between the pieces while Abraham watched. What do you think that was? That's the, that's the glory of the Lord. Um, that passes, the Shekinah, the Lord somehow passes between the pieces. While Abraham watched, notice that? What do we say normally should happen is the two will walk shoulder to shoulder and they'll swear together. But no, Abraham's lying on the ground having just kind of been slain in the spirit and, and under the power of all of this, watching this happen and that Shekinah glory passes through between the parts, these gory parts. Now, what, what does that mean when you pass between the parts? What is being said? So be it to me if I should break this covenant. It's terrifying. It's just unnerving uh, to, to think what, think of what he was saying. Passing alone between the parts, the Lord was saying, may this happen to me if you break this covenant, God's not going to break a covenant. So there's, there's no, almost no point in it. But in other words, God is saying no matter what, he, he does it, but he does swear that if something, the covenant is broken, this will happen to me. Now keep that in mind because it happens to his son. He, he, this is fulfilled. Think of what he was saying. The answer explains why Jesus was brutally savaged in his crucifixion. He was bearing the curse for Abraham's family, by the way, which includes us. We who believe are grafted into the olive tree of that family. Abraham and Sarah are the root, the, the, the root of faith, and we are grafted into that family. So he was bearing that curse. Have you ever wondered why did Jesus have to die so violently? Why couldn't he drink the hemlock like Socrates? I mean, that seemed like a, I mean, if he had to die, okay, he has to die. But why couldn't he die a nice death? Why, why did it have to be so disgusting? He was, why did he have to be whipped and crucified? And I mean, just go on and on and on until he's just savaged. This is why. This was the curse. He bore that curse. God had sworn, so be it to me, and you should break this covenant. I will fulfill my promise. And by the way, the promises that Abraham are not only for the land or for children, but for spiritual descendants, that he would be a spiritual blessing to the nations. And how many of us can say amen to that? Aren't we grateful? God was fighting for his savior. This is about bringing a savior into the world and rescuing the human race. This is, anyway, don't preach. What now go to Genesis, uh, uh, pardon me, Exodus chapter 24. 
This is Mount Sinai. The nation has gathered. Uh, God has given them the Ten Commandments and all of that and, and, and said all of these things. He's, they're, he's, they're gathered to the mountain. Uh, the smoke and fire and all is going on, on the mountaintop. And it says here in, 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 cha in chapter 24 of, of Exodus, he says, then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. So these come up the mountain. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but, and they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with them. And then Moses came up and, and, and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and the ordinances, and, and all the people answered with one voice, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. So, little, so Moses reads the, the covenant requirements. And I'll, I'll explain more of that in a minute. He reads, here's what, here's what God requires of us. Will we be his people? Will we enter into covenant with him? And they all go, yes, we will. We will do what the covenant demands. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord, and he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings. Now listen to this, verse 6, Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they all said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now, somebody tell me what he, what he would have done is very likely take a branch of hyssop, which is a, is, is a sage. It's a member of the sage family. If you've been to Israel, you, it's the most beautiful smelling thing, and they use it to scent their food and flavor it's a, anyway it's gorgeous but you take this this woody bread and he would have dipped that and he would have had undoubtedly help because you got a you got a million and a half people at least so he's you're dipping this blood and as they walk by you sprinkle them so that they're covered with blood on the front of them what what's being said so be it to you if you should break this covenant May you be savaged and cursed should you break his covenant. They're vowing a curse upon themselves. That's the blood. Boom. They're vowing that they would be cursed. Now, go with me to the, <clears throat> what happened in Mount Sinai. The sacrifices in the tabernacle and the temple from then on were the same animals as Abraham used in his covenant. Did you notice? You've got the sheep, you've got the, you've got the goat, you've got goats can be used. They're kind of interchangeable. Uh, you've got the doves, you've got the, the heifer, you've got the, and those are animals, and it's not an accident. Yes, they're clean animals, but there are other clean animals. What, when, from then on, the sacrifices of Israel recounted this moment. And, uh, and now let's go on. Go with me to Genesis 22. This is a remarkable story. Abraham is at Beersheba. Do you know where Beersheba is? It's, it's south, way down by the, in the Negev. Um, if you... Uh, not everybody goes there when you go to Israel. They don't all go to Beersheba. When I go, it's the first place I go. <laughs> when we go, um, you, but it's it's there and it's 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 a, a place located between two stream beds, wadis. There's the Hebron, so the thing goes all the way up to Hebron, and then there's the Bethsor, which and, and they're only a few hundred yards apart, and so it's a very um, there's a lot of water and groundwater. So there's a well there, and there's, there's still the tell, the ancient town. So he's in Beersheba, which you need to know. 
And then the Lord says to him, you know, go take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. This is disgusting. God hated human sacrifice. What's he thinking? Why would we even have such a, a, a moment as this? Abraham is being told to take Isaac, his son, his only son, notice that, and he's to take him, it's 50 miles. And he, he will go right on up that Hebron when, when you're there. I mean, if, if I have pictures on my phone, I can show you. Uh, you, you. You just go right on up that river bread and you, that would be your highway. And you just follow right on up, it takes you past Hebron and you'd go right on to Jerusalem. So Mount Moriah is what we call Mount Zion. It's there where the temple is. Imagine that. He's asked to go 50 miles to a place and then at that very place offer his only son. Um, it's, the thing is shocking. I'm sure it was to him. I have no doubt um, Sarah didn't know where, where they were going. Um, and then he takes him and we, you know this, this story. He, he puts Isaac on the altar. He has a knife in his hand and he's going to sacrifice him and follow through with what God has asked of him. And then God stops his hand, cries, don't harm the boy. And he lifts his eyes and he sees a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And he, the Lord says, don't sacrifice him. Here, here's, I'm, I'll provide a sacrifice. And then notice this. Uh, I'll start at 13. Abraham raised his eyes, looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called it that place Jehovah Jireh. This is where we get that. We hear that. The Lord will provide, as it is said this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. What will be provided? A sacrifice. The Lord will provide his own sacrifice in this mount. Now, where are we? We're on the very hill where the temple would be built later. Temple is built uh, probably a little farther down on Aruna's threshing floor, a flat spot. Up on the top of this hill, and or where, where it was, Jesus Christ will be crucified, probably probably almost within hundreds of yards or who knows where, he, where Abraham was doing this, but probably on the top of that hill. Now imagine that. So here we have, when the, so from then on, notice your notes, the shofar, the ram's horn was blown when it was blown. Mount Moriah was where the temple was built. Israel was reminding themselves of God's promise. So every time you have the, the ram's horn, it goes off at nine o'clock in the morning. It goes off at three o'clock in the afternoon. And you are making an offering in this place. It's reminding themselves of God's promise, saying to the Lord, Lord, you promised to provide a sacrifice for our sins in this mountain. God was telling Abraham, this is a prophetic act. This is not some kind of just careless thing where God just decided to do something really crazy and ask Abraham to do it. He is, Abraham is modeling. If you follow Abraham's life, he is taught virtually every lesson of faith that you and I are taught. He's taught the resurrection, we're told. Paul says that in, in Romans 4. By, he, he had to believe that his old dead body and, as, and Sarah's could conceive children. Paul says he, he had to have, he had to believe that God had raised the dead too. And, and so he was taught lesson after lesson. Here he's being shown something profound. He takes his only son to Mount Moriah and God spares his son and says, no, I'll provide a sacrifice here. But what was the sacrifice? In that very place, God would sacrifice his son for our sins in that very place. Now that's just, when you look at it, it's just amazing that what's happening in this, in this moment. So the cross, oh, pardon me, God was telling Abraham that he wouldn't have to sacrifice Isaac, but in that very place, the father would give his son 
as a sacrifice. This was the price God would pay for passing between the parts alone. God had made that vow and we had broken the covenant. The cross was the place, was placed on Mount Moriah. Jesus died at 3 p.m. when the shofar was being sounded from the nearby temple. Remember, Luke tells us that, 23, uh, 44. Luke says it was, it was in, it, it, when the, when the afternoon sacrifice. And so as that shofar is going off in the temple, you can hear it. You know, on his butt blow. That, it says he gave up and died on the cross at that moment nearby. Now, ancient Near Eastern treaties. I'm going to just run through this briefly. I want you to see there's a format to these. Treaties, these ancient covenants were written down. In fact, you have whole portions of covenants in your Bible. They had a preamble in which they identifies the author of the treaty and gives titles and the attributes of the author. Historical introductions, which is the benevolent deeds of the king on behalf of the vassal, are recounted and made the ground of the suzerains, the powerful ones, appeal to the weaker ones to render future obedience and gratitude for past benefits. So God says, I'm the Lord your God. I taught you, brought you out of the land of Egypt. I, 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 I opened the Red Sea for you. I fed you manna in the wilderness. I watched over you like a husband. I carried you in my arms through the wilderness. I have defended you. Will you trust me and enter into covenant with me? And that's what happened at Sinai. Notice it was after God had demonstrated his faithfulness that God called on them to make a covenant with him. Would they trust him? Would they swear to be loyal to him? And of course, by the way, none of us missed the point. It was only apparently days after they made that covenant that they made a golden calf or no 40 days at least after but that's that's another thing um so this the treaty stipulations there are general principles on which the future relationship to be based if you're going to do this i want you to obey me i want you to have no other gods i want you to make make, make an idol i want you to keep my uh, don't take my name in vain uh, i want you to um honor the sabbath day and keep it holy i want you to honor your father and mother uh, don't kill don't steal don't lie don't commit adultery and then and then all those are the general principles and then all kinds of uh, uh, specific stipulations as to what i want and how i want you to worship me and then divine witnesses and guarantors of the treaty curses and blessings are brought in so when you read you might just turn with me briefly to uh deuteronomy Look at Deuteronomy 28. Um, you have in Deuteronomy 28, the, by the way, the entire book of Deuteronomy is understood to be a covenant format. So it has, its, it has the, the various things I've said. It has the preamble, it has the historical introduction, and treaty stipulations, it's, it's one big covenant document and with the blessings and the curses. So you know this, these passages and where the Lord says the blessings here. It says, if you will diligently obey the Lord your God and be careful to obey all his commandments, which I command you this today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord with your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall you be your offspring of your body and produce of the ground and offspring of your beasts and increase of your herd. It goes on and on the basket and bowl and you'll be the, I like the, you'll be the head and not the tail, you know, and all of these promises of blessing are being given. And then look at verse 15 and then it shifts. It says, but it shall come about if you will not obey the Lord your God to observe and do all of his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today, that these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall you be your basket and your kneading bowl and your offspring of your body and your herd. And you'll be when you come in and when you go out. And even, it even says you're going to get mildew. I mean, it, it just goes on and on and on with, with all of these curses that if you disobey me. Now, keep this in mind. So the people of God have sworn, so be it to us, if we should break our covenant with you. 
and it's based on is I'll bless you if you obey me and I'll bring these curses upon you if you disobey me and they have been splashed with blood and sworn so be it to us if we should break this covenant. Israel is a theocracy. They were they were people that are different than any other govern any other government that I can think of. They, they were in covenant with God as a nation. They were they and when I say in covenant, not just some some vague statement. They've got blood splashed on them. The the ancestors, the elders, the leaders of this nation had all implored themselves that they would be a covenant people with God. Um, and so when they break the covenant, God threatens to do the curses. So have you read the Old Testament and wondered, why does God say such awful things? Uh, what, he's going to do this to them. He's going to do this to them. It's like, kind of like, isn't that a little much? Do you have to say it so strongly? He is not, doing nothing more than saying, I will bring the curses you have invoked upon yourself upon you. They all understood this. He wasn't speaking hyperbolically. He was, he was, he was, he was fulfilling the covenant. And, and listen to this. The prophets were spokespeople for the covenant. So when you read the prophets, they're not just grumpy old people kind of going off. They are saying, don't you get it, Israel? If we walk away from our covenant, if we violate these things, we have invoked upon ourselves a curse and it will come about. If we walk away from him, these will come. And it did. <laughs> but God was, and God, God was merciful. But I want you to see there's a cohesion between the whole thing. There's a foundational act that's gone on with Abraham. And then the entire nation of his descendants have entered into a covenant at Mount Sinai with him invoked these things, sprinkled with blood. They blow the ram's horn. They continue to offer these sacrifices that, that Abraham offered. They're there, reminding the God of they are in covenant with him. The prophets are spokespeople for this covenant. And then let's go to one more place, Jer J Joshua 24. Joshua, this is the end, of course, and he is going to have a covenant, a renewal ceremony. There's a number of these where they, where the nation not only has the first covenant they made there in Sinai, but they will renew their covenant. They'll revow uh, to do it. And so, but I want you to just see, let's see what's here in Joshua 24. You're going to see the very covenant format that I told you about the preamble, the historical introduction, general principles, just watch this. This is, this is a covenant format. Uh, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their judges and officers. They presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, from ancient times, your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Remember that? And then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. So we have a preamble. We have historical introduction. God's telling us what he's done for us. And Isaac, to Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. And to Esau, I gave Mount Seir and to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. And then I went, sent Moses and Aaron and I plagued Egypt by what I did in its midst. And afterward, I brought you out. Remember that? I freed you from this land of slavery. I brought your fathers out of Egypt and, came, and you came to the sea. And Egypt pursued your fathers and chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. Remember what I did for you? When they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. With your own eyes, you saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. He's recounting his faithfulness to them in the Exodus. So he's telling you, 
And then I brought you into the land of the Amorites. The word Amorites means people of the West. It's, West, it's the Babylonian westward migration who lived beyond the Jordan. And they brought, fought with you. And I gave them into your hand. And you took possession of their land when I destroyed them from before you. And then Balak, the son of Zippor, um, tells about Balaam and the cursing. And yeah, I, didn't cur I didn't let him curse you. Apparently, he was a powerful dude. Um, they did kill him later. Uh, you crossed the Jordan and came into Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho fought against you, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, that's Jerusalem, and thus I gave them into your hand. Then I sent a hornet before you, and I don't know what that means. It's, uh, it's fascinating. It, and it, it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, not by your sword or your bow, apparently some kind of thing with bugs. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities you had not built. So here's God saying, look what I've done for you. Look how good I've been to you. Look what a faithful, if, I, if I'm your God, look how I provide for you. I protect you. I watch over you. You can trust me. You can, you can trust me to be your God. Will you let me be your God? If, if it's disagreeable, and then um, Joshua says, if it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the rivers, in other words, the moon gods and all of Ur of the Chaldees, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. It's going to be Baal and Asherah and that kind of thing. But as for me in my house, this, this is that wonderful statement, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered, listen now, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is who brought us out of our fathers out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage and who did great signs and in which we went among these peoples through whom we passed. The Lord protected us as we passed through certain nations. The Lord drove out from us the peoples and we will serve the Lord for he is our God. So this is, this is their claim. This, they do it three times. And Joshua said, you won't be able to serve the Lord. He's holy. and He's a jealous God. He'll not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake and, for, and serve foreign gods, he will turn and do you harm. He'll bring curses upon you. After you have done, he's done good to you. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said, well, your witness is against yourself. You've chosen for yourself the Lord and we will serve him. Said to, to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. We vow. Now, therefore, put away foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to the Lord. The people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey his voice. And Joshua made a covenant with the people that day. So there may well have been another splashing of blood on everybody, or at least on the, on the leaders, and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law, and he took a large stone and set it up under the oak that was by the sanctuary and he said to all the people this stone shall be a witness for us against us it has heard all the words of the lord which he has spoken to us and it shall be a witness against you so you do not deny your god and he dismissed them to their inheritance where do we see in our culture today anything that resembles covenant where would you say so covenant is invokes a curse and a promise of blessing, but solemnly in calls upon the spiritual world, as it were, to reinforce this promise. Felicia, I see your hand. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, swearing in for uh, witnessing at a trial and also swearing in for government officials. Yeah, what do they do? Even even to this day, I, 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 often a president or somebody else will put their hand on the Bible, and uh, you know, then they you raise your hand, you promise to swear, and it says, "So help you God." Uh, in other words, you're invoking God, meaning may God help you tell the truth, but may God also get you if you don't. So you're actually swearing to your, I swear, and may God get me if I don't. He helped me tell the truth and may he zap me if I don't. And so you're 
yes, it, exactly. Where else do we see? There's, a, there's another, at least, uh, prominent area of covenant. Uh, Diane, do I see your? Covenant of marriage. Yes. Do you promise to, to, to love and uphold uh, in sickness and in health, for better or for worse, richer or for poorer? Um, as long, do you promise to be faithful as long as you both shall live? So help you God. I do. Do you have witnesses? That's what everybody's, that's what they're really for. They're not just, it's not just an audience. They're meant to be witnesses saying, we were there, we heard you say it, you made that promise. <laughs> and then in front of God, uh, you make a vow to each other and you vow to be faithful and love each other. Um, so help you God. It, that's, some people, you know, you hear people make light of marriage and say, oh, it's just a piece of paper. My foot it is. People understand it's a very solemn thing. And that's why people are afraid of it. Um, I'll tell you what's a piece of paper, a divorce. Uh, that's, but that's another matter. The, the, the vow of, of, of marriage is a solemn, scary thing. You are promising before God and these witnesses to learn to love this person, because <laughs> that's really what happens. To learn to love this person and be faithful and the rest of your life. It's, a, it's, it's where we, we, it's one of the key things we still have as covenant um, that's part of it. You'll hear people say all sorts of things about covenant, but now you know what a covenant is. This is what a covenant is. It's a spiritually reinforced uh, vow, a promise, um, calling upon God to bless us and help us keep it and also to discipline us if we do not. And in any other areas, what, what, is, what, is, what is this? Um, I'm gonna, I have a few more things that I can say, but I just wanted to, to let this settle in. Do you, do, so this theme runs through the whole um, Old Testament and right into the New Testament. Let, let's, just, let's just pick that up there. So Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took some of the Passover meal, the bread, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. He's saying, I, I'm the Passover lamb. He's also saying, I'm the covenant sacrifice. And then he took the cup after supper, uh, saying, this cup is the new covenant. Now, the new covenant, that is not just a vague thing. You, as we've seen, he's referring to Jeremiah 31, in which God says, you broke the covenant I made with you at Sinai. Though I was a husband to you, I cared for you. You violated my covenant. But he says, days are coming, says the Lord, and I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Why? Because the the seed of Messiah, the Savior, is in your midst. And I promised your parents <laughs> that I would be faithful to you. And so even though you have blown it, I will not forsake you. I will stay with you, and I will bring from you the Savior that I have promised. And I will make Abraham and Sarah a blessing to the whole earth. So he, so he stays committed and, he, and this is all based on covenant. So he says, here's, here's the covenant I'll make with you after those days, says the Lord. I will, I will take and I will, I will write my law upon your hearts. I'll gather you from the land. I'll bring you together. And I'll write my law upon your heart. And you will serve me from the least to the greatest. You shall all know me. I love that. We'll have relationship. And you will love me from the heart. And you will walk with me. That's the new covenant. So Jesus holds this up. And he says, this is the cup is the new covenant. What? In my blood. I have to die for this to happen. I, there's a curse. And you've all earned it. <laughs> and somebody's got to pay it. And 
we pass through the parts alone. And I'm the son and I'm going to pay the curse so that this can be brought to you. I just want you to see the, 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 the Bible isn't a, isn't a collection of random thoughts. <laughs> this theme runs right consistently through the Bible. And when he holds that cup up and offers it to us, he says, now the new covenants come because I die. Because I, the, the curse of the, of the covenant, has, because of your failures, has fallen on me. I bear it so that you might get, be given the new covenant and God might write his law in your heart. Remember how we've talked about the new birth? God has promised to do this wonderful new thing inside us. This is, it's just a huge promise that, and blessing that God brings. Just a, a few more thoughts and then I've got, I got eight minutes and then I'm gonna stop. The language of the Bible is built around this covenant as you might expect. So let's pick up a word you often see uh, th there's a word like, uh, it'll get translated all sorts of ways, loving kindness, steadfast love. Um, I'll bet you there's others. I'm trying to pull it out. And you'll say that thy loving kindness is better than life. Dave, David constantly in the Psalms used the phrase, uh, we translate it loving kindness. It's kind of a bizarre translation. You go, what's that? Well, the, the word is is we translate or transliterate it, H-E-S-E-D, chesed. You'd put a, it's got a breathing, a guttural, chesed. And it means covenant love. So when David appeals to chesed, to God's loving kindness, and you see it over and over again, or his steadfast love, however your, your Bible translates it, he's appealing and saying, God, you covenanted to love us. You promised in the covenant that you would love us and that you would not ultimately forsake us. You discipline us, but you would not forsake us. I call on you to love me because of the covenant. You hear it? It's not just, just general God's good nature. He's calling on the covenant. Here's, here's another. Truth. The word truth, uh, emmet. E-M-E-T-H. Um, that is the, the blessings, the promised faithful actions of the covenant. When you call on God and say he's true, it means he does what he covenanted to do. He promised to bless us. He promised to, to care for us. He in our covenant, he said all of these things. This is, this is how, how, how the Bible thinks. He promised to do these things. He is a true God who is faithful to do what he says. Um, righteousness, that big word. It's, it just means a person who, who does what they promise to do in the covenant. God is righteous because he does what he promised to do in the covenant. When it says in Psalm 71, I think it says, his, right, his righteousness reaches to the heavens. That means God does what he what what he, he practices what he preaches what he asks he keeps his covenant he does what he's promised to do he asks us to do it he 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 does the same thing his righteousness it's clear into the heavens does his, faithful to fulfill his promises to keep his covenant requirements All right, I think I've, I just want you to see that great theme to understand how it carries right into the New Testament, uh, how God was constantly um, thinking of that. If you, I think in the future, if you read, the, as you read the prophets, when you hear them, you'll hear the blessings and the curses. You'll hear the covenant language. You'll hear loving kindness. You'll hear... You'll hear righteousness, you'll hear truth, you'll hear all of those words. They're all built on this solemn covenant that the people have made with God. All right, I'll stop. Thoughts, questions, uh, applications, please. Hannah, I see your hand. Yeah, I do have a question. I'm kind of 
it was a little bit stuck on and I, I, I'm kind of stuck on that. God uh, walked through, walked through the, the, the um, with Abraham by himself. Right. Um, so I'm trying to kind of grasp that. So I'm going to ask a couple questions here. It, it, when we say the old covenant, is that talking about covenant with Abraham or covenant at Sinai? Well, they would. Like old, test, old covenant be, versus new covenant. Right. They, most of them would be referring that to the Sinai. Okay. And then if when Jesus, talking about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, is that representing now that God is breaking the old covenant and therefore there is a also a curse, like curse when he walked through that alone with Abraham, he was saying the curse is going to be, right? Like he walked through it. So Abraham or the human race didn't have an obligation or an expectation. So is the curse being on Jesus because God is now breaking the old covenant? Like actually breaking a covenant. We, we had, God did not break his covenant. We okay. Broke. And so, but he paid, up, he paid the price for, instead of requiring that that curse, do, which in, in, a, in, a, in a normal pattern, we broke the covenant, that curse should have fallen on us. Mm -hmm. But he bore the curse for us. Okay. And the punishment of the curse uh, fell on him. And so he, he took and fulfilled that. Then we, by faith, those who put their faith in Jesus are made, are for us, that's been paid. Okay. Those who so, have not joined, do not have faith in Jesus, that I suppose the, the curse, in a sense, of, and death and all of that still remains. Okay. So can you refresh, like, um, clarify for me the message behind? Um, the message of why God walked uh, that covenant alone and didn't have, like Abraham didn't walk and why God did it alone. I think that would help. I, I think God was saying, so be it to me, mm -hmm. if you break the covenant. It was, it was, uh, it, yeah, it, it, he literally said, you're not capable of keeping this. Yes. Okay, I hear that. It, if, if it relies on you, this will fail. Right. But I will do it alone. It, you'll, you'll see, there's, 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 you know, you have, by the way, there's conditional covenants. We, we see those in the Bible where God says, if you do this, I'll do this. It's the if then thing. And then every so often, it's the zeal of the, of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. It, 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 is, it is not a conditional covenant. It is a unilateral covenant. God says, I'm going to do this, whether you do your part or not. Okay. So Sinai, the Sinai, is that a conditional covenant? And then yes. Abraham's is a zeal of the Lord covenant. Correct. Yes. Got it. Thank you. That makes sense. Yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Sinai is a perfect example of a conditional covenant, and they failed it. And um, that's why the law cannot save. Yeah, I see Brent. Yes, sir. A couple of things. Um, we attend Messianic Church, Messianic Congregation, and last weekend on Shabbat, there was a wedding and uh, fantastic ceremony. One of the things that they did that I find very interesting and applicable to this is that they, they made a covenant. They took a rope and made a lasso with two lassos and they put it over the bride and the groom. And they said, this, is, this represents the covenant you have to each other and no one else is to enter into this covenant. This is between just you two. That you're to be betrothed, you're to be married and wedded together. That's the first thing. Second thing is, I think Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through about uh, 9 and 10 are, it really says what Israel did to break the covenant with God, that they committed, Israel and Judah committed adultery. And God even, it says, even issued them a certificate of divorce. 
And they broke that covenant, that love covenant with God the Father. And so that, because of the, the original covenant with Abraham, that if you do this, I have to pay the price. I think that that's a great example of why and where that came from right there. Jeremiah 3, verses 6 through, through 10 or, or 9 or 10, right in there. Brent, Brent is bringing in a, a, a really a, a true and important part of this. The covenant with God at Sinai was really, all, it was a covenant. And, and I talked about the blood and the splashing and everything else. But it, it has a lot of overlap with a marriage ceremony. There was a, there was a love in it, and the Lord is, is is as a husband taking Israel as his bride, and um, he, there's there's a lot of parallel and the language. And so when as Brent points out, when Israel failed this and, and they would go to other gods, which indeed had sexual things. I mean, they, they, their, the worship was full of sexual behaviors. But God says, you've, you've committed adultery. You've, you've gone after another love. You don't love me. Because he, he ultimately wanted to be loved, not just, not just mm -hmm. obeyed. He wanted to be loved. And um, he loved them. And he wanted them to love him and be loyal to him. So it's a loyalty issue. And so you hear in God's heart at times, um, just this whole sense of being a, of a, of a, of a a sad lover who's had had his bride leave him. What is isn't Hosea uh, with Gomer? What a, what oh, yeah. a great story uh, here. And, and Hosea is literally living out in front of Israel the experience that God goes through. Yeah. I've loved you. I've taken you back, and I've taken you back again, and you keep leaving me, you know, um, for other lovers. And, and so God likens himself to a, to a, to a husband who's been abandoned by his wife. And, and that, so there's, a, this, there's this whole deep love theme and, and marriage theme that goes into it. So you, it's not just a cold business deal when God does it. It's, it's very, very much filled with love. Heartfelt, yeah. He, he even says that they commit adultery with wood and stone. It's just very graphic language it says exactly what they did and judah saw it and did the same thing right. that israel did right. goodness thank you thank you for that felicia i saw your hand next and then kareen hey there so i had a couple of things that i um wanted to bring up that god kind of has revealed to me in studying covenant um the first one was about uh jesus and how he relates to that old covenant and new covenant kind of playing off of the previous question um, is that Jesus fulfills the old covenant himself through his life. Um, and then he becomes the sacrifice. He was the sinless lamb. Um, but because Jesus of his uniqueness of being fully God and fully man, he becomes a representative head of God making the new covenant and the representative head of man making the new covenant and he makes the covenant with himself and he also becomes the sacrifice for that covenant and that's why when we talk about believing in jesus i always thought it was really weird when i first became a christian that people would say well anyone who believes in jesus's name is saved and that's scriptural but what does believe mean like is it enough for me to say i believe jesus well clearly not because demons aren't saved and they believe in jesus right and so um, it, it's about making Jesus that covenant head, that Lord of your life. He becomes your representative head. And if he is your representative head, you're entering into the new covenant with God. But if he's not, you're outside of the new covenant. Um, so that was one of the things that uh, kind of God was revealing to me because um, I have a lot of discussions with people who are in cults about atonement and, and why it doesn't matter and, and why it shouldn't matter. So anyway, um, that, and then I've always wondered why we weren't supposed to make oaths. And it was like, God was just revealing to me as you were speaking that if we're in a covenant with God, anyone we make an oath to, um, now God has some sort of obligation and maybe like that comes into conflict with his holiness and his righteousness. So that's why we're not supposed to make 
posts is because we're bringing God along for that ride, you know? We do. Good, good insights. Um, can you see how covenant this whole, if, once you understand that concept, you begin to see it going right on through the Bible. And, uh, just at language after language, it, it's, it's, it, it begins to explain things. Corrine, your hand was next. Hi, um, very, very good lesson. And um, I learned a lot from you as well as from uh, when I took OSL with um, um, Pastor Dearman. I um, don't know a whole lot um, to be able to teach this. So I am really, really learning this. Um, it, it, it all makes, it makes sense. So I just want to say that it makes sense. Um, I wanted to ask a question and I think the young lady before me um, said the answer, but I want to ask it again. And um, is the Old Testament covenant fulfilled? And this is why I ask this because I understand and I know that Jesus um, took the punishment, the curses, of the Old Testament, um, but the blessing part gets gets me. If he took that punishment and the Old Testament was fulfilled, then did it free the blessings to be able to be transferred into the new covenant? Or is that just kind of done away with and now we are in an era of the new covenant, which is um, through Jesus Christ. So that's the one part of the question. So the second part of the question is in the New Testament, I mean, I can follow everything that's being said about the covenant that uh, God uh, um, um, made with Abraham even Isaac and Jacob, and then with the Israelites, that, that I can follow all of that. But in the New Testament, um, even though it is, it is through Christ, I'm believing that there's still something that we um, have to do, those that are in Christ, there's still a, a, a part of that covenant that we have to um, um, a be a, that we enter into. And so my question is, is when we enter into the new covenant uh, in the New Testament, um, are we entering it into it through continual um, repentance and belief and, 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 you know, following after the Holy Spirit? Because obviously um, God knows that in, in our flesh, we can't, even begin to um, uh, fulfill or, or, or enter into that covenant. But because the Holy Spirit has um, uh, uh, quickened us, made us alive, uh, 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 he wrote his word in our hearts, he's given us a new heart, he's given us a new spirit and um, has caused us to be uh, able to be obedient to him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, is that uh, our portion of, of, of the covenant of the New Testament? I, I hope that makes sense. It, it does, but it's, it's a big question. Um, <laughs> what, what, we, are jo we are joined to Jesus by faith. Um, one of the things I think we, we, we had earlier, and I think it went by quickly, is that God has established certain foundational principles in his in his universe the way he made it sin can be transferred as one but by faith he's allowed so that uh, there can become a one joining through faith and so when we join jesus by faith he becomes a, he, he has taken the curse for us and he has opened the, the door for the blessings of the covenant to us what is our job our job is to, to continue to have faith in him. And as you said, to in doing that, to be his disciples, to love him and to seek to obey him. And he, as we've said, our hearts want to. When a person really meets the Lord, 
Uh, they love him. They, they want to serve him. Doesn't mean they have, are sinless, they're not, but they want to. So I would say this, grace comes free. It's a gift of God by faith. I, I join Christ as you've died for me. I believe that. I surrender my heart to you. But blessings, you, I, um, hang on, are, are earned. Earn in a sense of not we deserve them, but in the sense of obedience. Blessings come through obeying and walking in obedience to the Lord. And then the, the blessings, the shalom, and we begin to have the same kinds of things. He, he does provide for us. He protects us. He cares for us. I mean, yes, there's life that goes on, but you, I, I know that most, most, I'm sure all of you can say this. You look at your life and you've seen the hand of the Lord on you. You've seen him open doors for you. You've seen him protect yeah. you. You've seen him provide for you. You have felt that flow of blessing. And you've watched people who have not chosen to walk in obedience for whatever reason. And they don't, they have trouble. <laughs> the way of the transgressor's heart, and, and it still is. So the blessings, just because I'm a Christian, I don't, I don't get all of the blessings automatically. Okay. They're a mine by automatic, they're meant to be mine. God wants them for me, but I do have to obey and walk in God's ways um, so that when, I'm, when I choose to, to put aside things that would tear my marriage apart and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm faithful to my spouse and I, or I'm um, honest in the way I do my business life or I speak the truth, I'm not a liar. Um, those kinds of things bring a blessing and a peace and a healing in, into my life. And, and it, it really does. So I, I say the blessings of the Old Testament of, of Abraham's, we are blessed with Abraham. Uh, uh, we are, we, those blessings are ours too. As we walk in obedience uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit with him, our lives prosper. They, ju they just do, even though the society may have its own struggles. God's hand is with our life. And, and you'll just see it that you can't, you'd, you'd, you'd be unfaithful to, to deny it. <laughs> it's that real. Suzette, excuse me, I'm going on and on. I got to stop. No, I, I love this. And uh, I love that, Corrine, what you asked about that. I, I often think, well, the Lord is not going to bless us to hell. You know, just like we don't want to bless our children so much that they don't learn principles that they need to learn. Right. So, but um, I just wanted to share that um, this uh, the story of Abraham and Isaac was, that's how I, the gospel that I first heard that brought me, you know, that I ended up getting saved was that story that that's what was shared with me, not the typical sharing of Jesus, but bringing the whole story of Abraham and Isaac. And someone shared that with me. And then, you know, I was thinking, wow, how could, how could he sacrifice his son like that? And, and, you know, or even attempt to do that. And then the person explained to me how like the ram in the thicket was Jesus, you know, a representation of how God said, okay, I'm going to provide the sacrifice. And, it, and the sacrifice was Jesus Christ. And I was like, what? You know, and I just, I, it was so amazing to me when I heard that, I couldn't believe it. And it was actually, uh, that was on a Sunday afternoon that someone told me that. It was that following Wednesday that I got saved. Praise so, I mean, yeah, it was amazing. And I always say, I didn't hear the traditional gospel, but that is the gospel, right? You bet it is. I mean, basically, <laughs> that the gospel is being preached right there in Genesis 22. I will, you won't have to, but I'll bring my son here and I will sacrifice my son for you. Yeah. Wow. I just want to <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Suzette. Anyone else? All right. Um, well, let's see. Um, let's let's pray. Uh, this next week, we're going to talk about resurrection, and uh, we're going to see what is what is the Lord. Um, not only his resurrection, but what has he 
promised for us because you and I are going to be resurrected. And what does that mean? And uh, we'll, we'll try to, to really understand, understand that truth. So over these weeks, we've talked about the fall. Remember, we were in the Garden of Eden. We saw the very heart and nature of God being expressed, he, um, the, the freedom of the choice he gave us because he wanted children, not slaves. It's always been that. We've seen repentance, what it was. The apple has to go back on the tree. There is that, that willful surrender to him and trust. It's ultimately a trust where we give him the right to be our Lord and guide us and, and uh, correct us and direct us. We saw the new birth, that what Jesus came to give is simply a transaction. Pray this and I, you go to heaven. He came to bring us something where we are born from above. God comes and does a deep work in the human heart. It goes clear back to Deuteronomy 30, at least, uh, where the promise is, I'll circumcise your hearts. I'll, I'll, I'll separate your, your heart from your flesh and allow you to love me and walk with me in obedience. Uh, we saw the uniqueness and centrality of Jesus last time. Remember that? But who he is, please, God didn't come down at Christmas and become a baby. He sent his son to become a human and die for us. And so that's what we're understanding. And that this was the center point of history before Jesus came, those who repented and trusted by faith that God would have mercy on them and provide a sacrifice, whether they knew all of the facts and things which they didn't, um, but they were counted righteous. And then now we look back on that and we recall those things and we trust him and believe. And then today we've talked about covenant and seeing how Jesus ultimately fulfilled the covenant and uh, was the one that it's always spoken of, and that this covenant concept is a foundation in the Bible. And Jesus fulfilled the covenant. We failed it, and he paid the curse of the covenant and uh, has made a way for us. And then now we're going to talk about his resurrection and ours, because he didn't, not only did he die for our sins, but he rose and broke the power of death. So there's two sides to this. There's forgiveness. And there's also freedom from death. He destroyed death. Now that's just big. And uh, we, we want to see that, what, what he did. Um, I, I see one. Uh, Elena, I see your hand. Thanks, Pastor. I, um, I appreciate the walkthrough of where we've been because it reminded me of two things. Um, I was in uh, a service at Northwest many years ago and the topic came up about death and, and I don't think you were preaching that day, but it was, well, we're all gonna die someday. And I immediately thought, I immediately thought, um, nope, I'm not gonna die. Who am I? I'm spirit, I live in a body. So that was immediate for me. Then later in my walk, um, I started to question the word saved because you recalled to us um, a couple of sessions ago how during the course of your 30 plus years at Northwest, you changed your salvation message from, from basically being Christ as Savior to Christ Savior and Lord and putting the apple back on the tree. And so a question I have is once saved, always saved? And what does the word saved really mean? If it really means accepting Christ as your savior and putting the apple back up on the tree, then I don't think anyone can take you out of God's hand. I, I just would appreciate your thoughts on that. I mean, do you think that individuals that um, say they're sorry and accept what Christ has done for them 
but choose not to repent are saved? I guess that's the question for you. God alone knows a human's heart. Yeah. So he, he knows whether there has been any genuine repentance or not. What, he knows what he's looking for. So that, the, the, that I'm just having to say, I, I, no one could pronounce that on someone else. However, do I think that I see people say, just this is, I'm going to just be practical. As a pastor, watching folks, watching my own life, watching people, does it appear that just praying and saying, Jesus, um, thank you, but in which I, but I haven't surrendered to him. I haven't bowed my knee. Uh, I haven't made him Lord of my life. I just acknowledge he died. Does it appear? It appears to me that I, I think it's a good step that was taken. I think I'm not, I don't want to diminish that, but I don't think it's complete. And I think you'll find people who kind of their salvation, as it were, is dragged out over time. And it starts one place and it works its way to a completion. Somewhere along the line, the Lord brings the full message in and there's wherever it is, they bow their knee and they, they say, Lord, you are my savior and my Lord. And I trust you. That can go on in a private prayer. That can go on in a, was there worshiping in a song? That can go on who knows where, but that God brings it to that place of surrender if they will allow it. Have, do they always allow it? I can remember one time I was, we had a, a, a Holy Spirit service and people were coming forward for, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I had this young man I didn't know come forward and, and we're praying. And I said, so I, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. And I said, um, he, may Jesus your savior, you believe he died on the cross? Yes, I do. Are you willing to have him? Is, is, is he your Lord? Well, no. Um, I said, well, are you willing to make him your Lord, to, to bow your knee and let him be your Lord? No. Um, well, you know, right now I haven't much more to give you then. Um, and and he, he had no intention of letting God run his life, but he did want to be, interesting, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, which I did not, we could, there was no place for, to go for. for the, I said, well, someday you will, I hope. Uh, you will trust him and you let him be your Lord, and that'll, but you're not ready yet. Um, so the intricacies of the heart are such that some people just don't know any better. And as soon as they're given an opportunity, they slide right into it. Some people are deliberate and defiant and don't want a Lord. And that's a very serious matter. Um, and no, I don't think they're saved. Uh, I, think they're, I think they still have an appointment with God and I think he's drawing them, I think he loves them. Um, but I think he's gonna, I think he's gonna press them one way or another. Okay. You'll find people who don't give up until their deathbed. Yeah. Have you, have you, I mean, have you guys led people to the Lord or seen that where, where they're literally on their deathbed? I have, yeah. where they finally just give up and, and receive the Lord on their deathbed. Um, there's all kinds of things that go on. God's trying to save everybody. But if people are holding, now you're down to the big question and I have five minutes. Mm -hmm. oh boy can you what does the bible say about this i've heard one famous preacher say the bible says doesn't say anywhere that you can lose your salvation that's simply not true um now lose is is a bad word but that a person can cease to be saved it, it's it says it over and over again as a matter of fact um and i i would be happy to teach once saved always saved if it were there i'm not i mean but it's not. And so the Bible doesn't allow me to say that. The Bible says this. The Bible says God is able to keep that which is trusted to him against that day. It, in other words, from God's part, his great arms are around me. His hands, are, he protects me. He defends me. Nothing, the Bible says, can pluck me out of his hand. If I choose to stay with him, I, there's not a Romans 8, there's not a power in hell. Not the devil himself can take me away from God. Nothing can take me away from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So I am absolutely secure in that. But then the Bible turns around on the other side and looks at me and says, but you continue to trust. 
you must continue to believe. Jesus uses the wonderful illustration of the, of the oil in the, in the lamp with the virgins. I ought to keep that lamp burning. Some brought extra oil and kept refilling, and some did not, and it burned out before they encountered the Lord. So I have a responsibility to keep putting oil in my lamp. And the, the flame in my mind is, is the flame of faith. As long as it, I may be sinning and struggling and failing miserably, but I love him and I'm trying and, and I believe in him, I'm saved. My sins are not the issue. My faith fundamentally is the issue. My faith in my heart to the person who loves him and wants to please him and, is, and, and believes in him, that person, their, their behavior is not judged, will not determine whether they go to heaven or not. See, people come from all kinds of backgrounds. Some people come with addictions and with situations and backgrounds that are just devastating. Some people have gotten themselves into things that they're, they're you know, it's all they can do to make it through the day and not take their own life. And other people have much easier lives. And the Lord knows that. He knows our hearts. But he, what is he looking for? He's looking for the flame. Do you, do, you, you, do you have faith in him? Are you trusting him? Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is really clear about this. It, it says in several places, it says, it, it uses different terms. And that's, the book of Hebrews is being written to people who were, think, who were backing away from Jesus. They were under persecution and they were saying, look, to Jewish people, they were saying, we were Jews and, and, and now being belonging to Jesus is getting us in trouble. So can we just put Jesus back on the shelf and go on with being Jewish? And the book of Hebrews says you cannot drift away, meaning just slowly lose your faith by neglecting it. You can't cast away your faith. In other words, throw it aside to protect yourself from persecution. You can't, uh, it's, it's, it's got a couple more. You can't you know, drift away, cast away. I've, I've got it written down. So it warns me, guard your heart. So what I, I, from my side of things, I don't want to accumulate sins. I want to confess them quickly. I don't want that to numb my conscience and drive me away. I want to um, Read, you know, keep my faith, read the word, do things like that. I'm not earning anything. I'm just keeping oil in the lamp. I'm just refreshing my faith. I'm just, I'm just walking my walk. My faith in the Lord is the most precious thing I possess. And I don't want it to die. I don't want it to be neglected. I don't want it to, I'm not going to sell it. You, you can't, you can't take it from me. I'll, I'll die first. Um, I'm not going to neglect it. I'm going to just care for it. So it's not an either or thing like, well, one, and, and people will say, look, a baby can't be unborn once it's born and all of this kind of, that's philosophy. It's not the Bible. The Bible does say you, God, God's great hands are around me and nothing can take me away from him. But then it turns to me and says, and you keep your faith strong. Thank you, Pastor. So it's, it's two, it's the two, it's the two sides. Truth is if I want to go to heaven and I do, there's nothing that's going to keep me from it. I'm going to heaven, folks. It's not a. It's not negotiable. I'm not worried about it. It ain't going to. It, nothing's going to take that away. I'm going to heaven, and not because I'm a great person. I. He will fight for me and defend me, and I have no intention of 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 neglecting my walk with him. How about you? You, you know. Amen. So it's 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 a. There's the there's the divine side and the human side. He's strong and he's watching over me and he'll pursue me. In fact, he'll discipline me. He'll hammer me. <laughs> he'll, I've, have you ever walked away from him a little bit? And he comes right after you. He's the hound of heaven. So you and I are quite safe in that sense. But is it impossible for me to defiantly walk away and neglect my... It is, apparently. The Bible does admit to that and warn us against it. So I... I can't say it doesn't. We are one minute over. Brent, do you want do you want to say one more thing, and then we'll make that the end? 
Actually, Wanda had her. Actually, hair. Wanda, I, yeah, I was just gonna say Wanda was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, the choice is ours. Um, we can, he, nothing can take us out of the hands of God, but us. The choice is ours. We can choose to leave him. He said he'll never leave us or, or forsake us. And we can, you know, we can take that promise to the grave with us. But he gave us choice. Whether we stay, that's on us. That's not on him. He's provided every avenue for us to, um, to belong to him, to be his son, to be his daughter. But it boils down to when you have genuine surrender, the choice is yours. You're going to stay with him. You're going to endure. You're going to realize the cost of following him or you turn and walk away. But the choice, he said, I'm never going to take that from you. I'm not that kind of father. I'm going to always leave that door open. Choose you this day who you're going to serve because you can't have two masters. And total surrender means you have one master. God, I genuinely repent of everything. I'm generally, genuinely in this thing. Um, as, as we talked about the marriage vow, till death do us part. Till you decide to rest me, I am going to stay with you. But it, bo it boils down to choice. Well said, and and you're absolutely correct. That's beautiful. Yeah, Brent, quickly. I, real real quick, that eighth chapter of Romans. You know, literally everything is listed there except for one thing, and that's myself. Right. I'm the only thing that can take me away or keep me away from God. Nothing else can. And thank goodness for that. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. If we choose, Wanda said it better. I can't even. I'm done. <laughs> thank you. And. And once the heart's been given to the Lord, and once you know him, who's going to walk away? I mean, I, I mean, we'd be crazy. It's nuts. So I think, I think we're, we're very secure in that. However, don't neglect your faith. Father God, thank you so much for this class. Thank you for just brothers and sisters in the Lord who love your word. We're full of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just want to be sharp swords in your hand. May the word of God be clear to us and strong to us so that we can, we can proclaim it and teach your word so that as the light of your truth comes into the world of people around us, Lord, who are struggling and looking, Lord, that we can declare you and teach you and people can be blessed by you and walk in the safety and care that you provide. You, you're a good father and we love you and you've sent your son for us. And there on Mount Moriah, Jehovah Jireh, you provide it for us. We confess it, we believe it, and we honor you for the gift of your, your son for us. And Lord, we declare also, he, you raised him from the dead and has seated him at your right hand. And from there he comes to judge the quick and the dead. Lord, help us believe and proclaim in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. God bless you all. Love you guys. It's a joy to meet with you. And we meet next week. And then the following will be Thanksgiving. And we will skip Thanksgiving, of course. Okay. All right. God Thank bless you. you. See God you soon. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Oh, happy God Thanksgiving. bless you all. Thank you.